The Old Testament reading is 1 Samuel, chapter 16, beginning with the first verse. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord does not see as we see. We look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. This great wisdom comes from a dramatic moment in Israel's history when God speaks to Samuel and tells him to go to Bethlehem. That sounds like neither here nor there to you and me, or it maybe sounds like a happy place. Bethlehem, that's where Christmas happened, right? But in those days, that was a dangerous junket for Samuel indeed. It's dangerous today, hard to get to Bethlehem. If you start in Jerusalem, even though Bethlehem is just a few miles away, it takes a long time. You have to pass through all kinds of checkpoints. There's barbed wire. There's a massive wall. You may have heard about this wall. It is at its largest around Bethlehem. Tremendous tension there between Palestinians and Israelis. One of the cool things about that wall is there's graffiti all over it, very clever graffiti. And what's interesting about the graffiti is none of it's hateful or angry. It's all like peace protesters, right? Instead of saying, we hate you on the other side, the graffiti has themes of life and hope and peace. My favorite piece of the graffiti is somebody drew there depicting God's tree of life and the roots of God's tree of life grow underground and finally actually grow under the wall and they begin to expand and expand. It actually breaks up the wall from beneath and the wall is shattered. And there's peace in Israel. It's beautiful. Samuel is told to go to Bethlehem at a time that there is no peace at all, and God has revealed to him that there will be a new king chosen from Jesse's sons. And so he goes to Jesse's house, and you know the contours of this story. And he says, bring out your sons. One of them must be the king. And so he brings them out. He lines them up, I guess, the way we line up ushers at a wedding, from tallest down to the shortest, from oldest down to the youngest. And the first, there's seven of them, and the first is Eliab, and Eliab is tall and strapping and muscular, and he's a military veteran. He's the kind of person, like, he's a number one draft pick. We take Eliab every time. He's the kind of guy that we want to lead us. But there's this pause, and then God says, he's not the one. The Lord does not see as we see. We look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. So he goes to the next tallest, Abinadab, not him either. Goes to Shammah, not him. Goes through four more brothers. And then there's another long pause. And Samuel looks at Jesse and says, is, Do you have any others? And Jesse says, Well, there is David left out in the field tending the sheep. And Samuel says, Bring him in right away. He comes in. David is the one. 
It's a theme that occurs over and over in the Bible in so many ways. God doesn't choose the obvious one that we would choose. God chooses the one that's overlooked. God chooses the one we didn't think of. God chooses the small. It's such a beautiful thing. God uses small things. God works in hidden ways. You know this in your own life. The most important things that are going on about you right now are not anything that anybody can see. What's keeping you alive is hidden from everybody else, including yourself. It's your heart beating inside your chest. It's your lungs respirating in there. That's why you're alive. Why does a tree live? A tree doesn't live because the leaves are really trying hard to live out there. No, it's the roots that are under the ground. It's what is hidden that is the source of life. It's always that way with God. God uses the small. God uses the unlikely. I was in uh, Florence, South Carolina the other day giving a talk, and at the end of it we had a Q&A, and it was an interesting conversation, the most interesting point being when a gentleman, he appeared to be perhaps in his 80s, he raised his hand, and I called on him, and he asked, why did God make me? <laughs> I said, uh, why do you ask? He said, I've lived all these years, and I've really never discovered what God's purpose was. For me might be. It's interesting. As we talked about it, it turned out he fell for what a lot of us fall for, is we think that God's purpose must be something huge. I actually heard a preacher saying that a while back. If it's not large, it's not of God. God has God-sized dreams. All this like, America's so into big, right? It's like we're all Texans or something. Somebody here is from Texas. I'm going to be in trouble later. I'm sorry. You know, so we have to, we're obsessed with what's big and successful and num you know what I'm saying. I said, does it could just be something small? I said to him, you know, if you're a guy like me, and I bet you are, that what you need is sometimes just like one person to love you and care about you and ask about you. Just one. We had the funeral yesterday for Rendez Brown. The, Boy who's about to turn 12 is involved in our church. Sad, sad day. And what's so touching is the number of people in our church over time who've done just one small thing. They've read to Rendez. They've played baseball with Rendez. It's just a small thing, but it's huge. It's what God asks us to do. It's the way God is, after all. When God came down to earth, God didn't come down as you know, like Eliab, big muscular, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger type. Yeah, God came down just as an infant. And God didn't come down to a royal palace in Rome. God came down to a manger in Bethlehem in the middle of nowhere. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he didn't come in on a war stallion like Alexander the Great. He wore, rode a humble donkey. When Jesus decided to get an organization going, he didn't form, you know, crack Roman troops that would march in line. He got a bunch of ragtag disciples who were pretty clueless about what they were doing. It's God's way. God does not see as we see. We look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. I've had this other thought about Jesse and this lineup of the sons. I mean, for the time, for years, I always assumed what happened is that Jesse hauled out the ones that he thought were likely candidates to be the king, and he thought that David wouldn't begin to qualify. That's why he left him out in the field with the sheep, but I wonder if that's right. Maybe, actually, he had a sneaking suspicion that David really was the one. After all, 1 Samuel says when they find him, he's ruddy. He has handsome eyes. Maybe Jesse actually saw the potential in his son, and he wanted to protect him. Because actually being the king in those days, that was not a great job. This is during the time that we're on the cusp between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And the Philistines were the first people to master iron. And the, and the Israelites were still back in the Bronze Age. This is sort of like smartphones versus dialing phones. Some of you don't even know what a dialing phone is. But once upon a time, we, yeah. Except it was weaponry, so your life was at stake. So you're accustomed to bronze weapons, and they've worked very well for you. Thank you very much. Except suddenly you're against the Philistines, so you come out with your bronze shield that has always worked against bronze swords. But the Philistines have an iron sword, and he swings it, and your bronze shield just is gone. You run for the hills. Who would want to be king at such a time? So I wonder if Eliab really stood tall, like, he will choose me. Or did Eliab kind of shrink a little, like, please don't pick me. Please don't. Pick me. Were they quaking in their boots? Was Jesse trying to protect David? 
I just wonder about the ways in which we protect others from what God is calling them to do. Parents do this sometime, right? St. Francis of Assisi, classic story. God was calling Francis to be really the greatest saint of the Middle Ages, but his father had a better idea, wanted to protect him from such a fate. He wanted to be a wealthy cloth merchant like he was. He had a better idea. He was going to protect Francis from this dismal fate of just being a poor saint. What about the ways that we protect someone? What about the ways we protect ourselves from what God is calling us to do? We're pretty good at that, occurs to me. What's interesting is that uh, David is the one that God's chosen. <laughs> it's a funny choice once you know the end of the story because David just bungles his way through. It's not like he was perfect. It's not like he always did what God wanted him to do. He's one mistake after another. But that's the cool thing about God's call is that God does it. For God to use you, you don't have to be perfect. Thank goodness. Right? None of us could make it. God can use people that, that bungle things and bumble their way through. I read something recently about Winston Churchill that England really needed him in World War II, but that actually in terms of his decision making day by day during World War II, Churchill made many, many mistakes, but yet he was still the one that England needed because he had a vision, he had a passion, he had a steely determination that England will not fall. So yes, he made mistakes, but yet he was the one that God used. I wonder if God can use us mistake-prone People who don't know what we're doing, but yet God's calling us. Here, here's what I want to focus on this morning is the following. Uh, Martin Luther one time was thinking about this business. The, the Lord sees not as we see. We look on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. And what Luther said was this. He said, the eyes are hard of hearing. You have to think about that. Take that home with you. The eyes are hard of hearing. Like what happens with our eyes is, is our eyes just aren't so good. They get fooled all the time. Uh, they get impressed by things they shouldn't be impressed by. They get disappointed by things they shouldn't be disappointed by. The eyes are hard of hearing. The eyes get fooled. Uh, this happens in relationships. Samuel has a kind of selective vision, doesn't he? He only sees what he wants to see. He doesn't see what's plain in front of him. His eyes deceive him. His eyes are hard of hearing. Uh, one of the cool things, I think, in our emotionally healthy spirituality is when Peter Scazzaro was here back in January, one of the things they said happens in relationships is that uh, we all attempt something that we're absolutely no good at, and that is mind reading. Mind, you probably do it uh, with friends and at work at various times. You know, someone's saying something and you, you read their mind and you think, oh, he must mean, and you're wrong every time, Right? You say oh, something happens, and you think, oh, that must be, and you're just, you're wrong every time. It's really deadly in marriages, right? People marry each other, and I shall read her mind, and you're so bad at it. You know, like, surely she was thinking this. Yeah, that never crossed her mind. We're terrible at it. And, and what Scazzaro says, instead of, like, trying mind reading, which you're no good at, you might actually try, here's a novel idea, listening. Like, who thought of such a thing? listening. Early in my marriage, I can just confess to you, and Lisa's not here, I can talk about her right now. <laughs> She's gone home for the day. Uh, early in our marriage, I was just the worst husband. You know, I'd sit down, and she would, she'd be trying to pour out her heart to me, and she would say something like, I remember one time she said, I feel like I don't have any friends. And I said, no, 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 you have many friends. And then she told me something else she felt. And I said, no, 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 you don't feel, no, no. I kept correcting. This is like I'm the most pathetic husband ever doing such a thing. And what I've learned over time is now if she says to me, I feel like I don't have any friends, I've learned to say, oh. <laughs> this is really effective. <laughs> I have found. And that's silliness. What I want us to think about is how, with respect to God, to say, oh, we're not good listeners. We don't listen to each other very well. We don't listen to our own lives very well. We don't listen to God very well. And I would suggest to you the most important thing in life is learning how to listen to people and to God. And it's what we're no good at. Isn't that interesting?
So I've been trying to think how to be a listener, how not to focus on the eyes that are hard of hearing, but how might I hear? Guys? So, so I, a friend of mine referred me this week to a guy who was part of the French Resistance during World War II. His name was Jacques Wousseron. I can't pronounce French worth a darn, but it's great fun to try, right? Jacques Wousseron, that's fun to say. And Jacques Lucieron, who is an interesting guy, he was part of the French Resistance, he wound up in the concentration camp, Buchenwald. Uh, but when he was eight years old, he, he could see, but then there was this accident at school one day and he lost all of his vision in one day. It's amazing. So he went from being a sighted person to being a blind person. But his parents never pitied him and he learned Braille and he became a war hero and then had a great career afterwards and he died in the 70s and he wrote about it. And I read, I read his autobiography this week. It's just a remarkable book. And the most amazing parts are when he talks about being blind, right? I mean, you think of someone blind, you might think, oh, how sad, how hard that must be, how to be pitied, someone who is blind. But here are just some things that Jacques Lucieron wrote about being blind. Since becoming blind, I've paid more attention to thousands of things. Since the day I became blind, I have never been unhappy. Since the day I became blind, I've begun to look more closely, not at things, but at a closer world looking from an inner place to one further within. He said, the source of light is not in the outer world. This is a common delusion. The light dwells where life also dwells, and that is within ourselves. He said that the light inside him was his, and nobody could take it away, including the Nazis. He said vision deals only with the surface. And so throughout the book, you see stories of the way he confounded friends and family by describing things that they could, that he could not see, that they could see. Uh, an example that he gives, this happens all the time, is you and I see anything that we see. You see the piano here. You see uh, that pitcher that we pour the water. For, you see this cross. And what we do is we, we kind of glance at it like, okay, I saw that. It's no big deal. But if you're blind, you can't just glance at it and like, let's say there's a table. You can't just go, oh, there's the table. If you're blind, what you have to do is you have to take your time, which is what we never do. You have to take your time with the table. So what he said he could do is that he could take his hand and he could run it over the surface of the table and he could tell you something of the story of that table. For instance, he could tell if it was made in a factory or if it was handmade. Because a handmade table's got little dips in the wood, and you notice, oh, it's not perfect. Must have been made by hand. He could feel something where there'd been a crack one day, and somebody had repaired it, and the texture there is a little different, and there's some putty in there. He wondered what happened to that table that made it break off right at that point. He could feel a little indentation in the table, and he wondered what it meant, because it was right at the place where someone would sit and eat at that table, and he wondered if they were spearing their food with a fork or something one day and just dug into the table a little? Is that what formed that? You can think about the story of a table. He, he met a violin maker, and I don't know about you, if I hear a violin, to me it sounds like a violin. Like, I'm brilliant, aren't you too? But as it turns out, violins made with different kinds of wood sound very different from one another. But you and I can't tell because we just see a violin and we hear it. But if you're blind and you think about it, different kinds of wood sound different in a violin. He learned to distinguish the sounds of trees. I mean, what does a tree sound like? And as it turns out, wind rustling through a poplar sounds pretty different from wind rustling through an oak, and that sounds very different from wind rustling through a pine tree. So he learned to listen to trees, and he could distinguish one kind of tree from another. You and I can't do this because we've never tried. It's not that the blind can hear better than anybody else. They just have taken the time to listen. And I think that's the most important project in our lives, is taking the time to listen. So I want to do you a little favor right now. I'm thinking it's a favor because what I want to ask you to do is just to be quiet 
for a little time. And my assumption is you, you could do that in your life, but you don't. You stay busy, you keep something turned on, there's always rackets, somebody's always, there's always something. You never really just get still so you can listen to a tree. But what I want to do is just for us to be quiet and to listen and see what, what does, what does a, a church with people in it sound like? Can we listen? Can we maybe hear ourselves with a slight rustle of somebody next to us? Or can we even hear God? I ask you to listen to something else, and if I were sitting where you were, you are, I'd think oh, it's a little weird. But trust me on this. One of the things in the emotionally healthy spirituality is we've talked a lot about just breathing. Most of the time, we have kind of shallow breaths in our life. But if you're having anxiety and you go to the doctor, one of the things they tell you to do is to breathe deeply. And I've got this app on my phone now, and it just makes me breathe deeply. I asked a couple doctors. They said oh, that's actually really good for you. So what I want you to do is just like breathe in and out deeply and listen to your own breath. I invite you to hear and feel like the, the love of God being breathed into you and and then you're breathing out, you know, that old life that focuses on appearances and gets impressed and gets confused all the time or disappointed or just breathe that out. It's the breath God gave you, gives you, gives the people around you. Then I want to ask you to do one more thing that is even stranger. And if I were sitting where you are, I would think, oh, no, no, don't ask me to do that. I was thinking the other day about a guy I was in seminary with named Greg who was blind. I saw this happen to him all the time. People would walk up to him and they would say, hi, Greg. <laughs> he would say, I'm blind, I am not deaf. <laughs> one of the things he told me is something that Jacques Lucerne wrote about is that if you're blind, one of the things you inevitably do is you, you just come in physical contact with people more than the rest of us. You know, you're walking somewhere, you've got to take somebody's arm. You're going on steps, you've got to take somebody's hand. Even this, I thought about this. Like if somebody blind came up to you and said, could I touch your face? Right? That'd be like a really cool... Um, if a sighted person came up and said, can I touch your face? You'd be like, oh, weird. So blind people, they have physical contact. Jacques Lucy Ron wrote about this. He said, I can thank my blindness for having forced me into bodily contact with my fellow human beings. He says, I have found this to be an exchange of strength and joy. So I want to ask you to do what we don't usually do here at the church, and if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. And if you want to do it and the person next to you doesn't want to do it, that's okay too. But if it's okay with you and the person next to you, just reach out and grab the hand of somebody. And we're just going to hang on to each other for a minute, and I'm going to ask you to uh, bow your heads and pray with me.
Almighty and gracious God, we need you. And it's really it's as, ur as urgent as something like a siren going by. We really need you. We need each other. We need the love in this room. We need to learn to do the only thing that really matters at the end of the day, and that's how to hear each other and how to hear you. We all week long, Lord, we have used our eyes. We've been impressed by what we've seen or, or we've been disappointed in what we've seen or we've been confused by what we've seen. And we just realize that with you, you're not impressed, you're not confused, you are never disappointing. Because you don't look at the outward appearances, you look on the heart. You look at each one of us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And what's amazing is we don't have to hide what's in the dark inside of us. But you see it and you love us. And you love the person next to us. You love the person that gets on our nerves. And you love the person we think's the problem with the world. You're amazing, Lord, and we're grateful. And what we ask you for is just for the rest of our lives. Help us to turn off whatever and be still and be quiet. Be able really not to mind read, but to listen to other people, how they feel, what they think. Help us to listen to the hurts in your world that we just soon have drowned out. But help us to hear. You hear. We want to hear. And Lord, show us how to listen to you. We've gotten to be hard of hearing, but we do believe you're still speaking to us. That you have something good to say, something wise to say. We would hear your voice, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.